Tola, tonight we're going to be speaking about one of the greatest miracles uh, in history of creation, talking about Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is something we speak about every year, and every year, inshallah ta'ala, we hear the, basically the same skeleton of the story, but uh, we should look for new nuances that we might uh, grasp and new lessons learned when we hear these things over and over again. This is one of the secrets why uh, of the Quran, many stories are repeated uh, so that we might have new openings every time we hear uh, the same story. So we'll begin with um, the date of the Isra. Some of the Salaf said it's in the year five after the Bi'tha of the Prophet The dominant opinion from the Tabi'een is that it happened at the end of the 10th year after the Bi'tha, the very end of the 10th year after the calling of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. No Sahabi mentions an exact year. This is from the Tabi'een. The month and the day, there's a difference of opinion. It's not mentioned by many of the Salaf. Later, uh, theologians and scholars, they had difference of opinion. Uh, the 27th of Rabi al Awwal is a very popular opinion of Al Alusi and Suyuti and uh, Imam Nawawi. Uh, the 17th of Ramadan is also given as a candidate. The 29th of Ramadan, the 27th of Rajab. Wallahu alam, this is not very essential. The important thing is what actually happened on this night and what lessons we can actually take from it. By the Jumhur of the Ulama, this happened after the, uh, the Amr al Huzun, the year of grief. Uh, this was a year in which the beloved wife of the Holy Prophet, Khadija al Kubra, anha, she passed away. And Abu Talib, the Prophet's uh, protector, ostensibly uh, passed away as well. And the Prophet, وسلم, he went to Ta'if uh, to make a da'wah to the Bani Thaqif, and as we know the story, he was turned out of the city and he was uh, stoned and bruised and bloodied and battered. And the Prophet وسلم, as the story goes, uh, he was in, under a tree in an orchard uh, when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reminded him of Yunus It's a very significant episode because some of the Quraysh had summer homes in Ta'if, right? It was like a sort of a luxury, Beverly Hills, if you will, of the Hijaz. So some of the Quraysh had noticed what had happened to the Prophet ﷺ. They felt bad for him, even though they were mushrikeen. So they sent him a Christian slave named Adas. And he got into a conversation with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet learned that Adas was a Christian from Nineveh. And of course, Nineveh was the city of Yunus ﷺ. So this was the Prophet's Yunus moment, when Yunus ﷺ was fit dhulumat. He was under darknesses, in the plural. Uh, he was given victory by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soon after that. So the victory comes in the Laylatul Isra, in the Uruj, the ascension of the Prophet sallallahu And we're reminded of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Inshirah, فَإِنَّمَا الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّمَا الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى With every type of Usr, and there's a definite article, Al-Usr, which is a difficulty, every type of difficulty. Every type of difficulty, there's a yusran, which is nakira, this is indefinite, which means it's not contained, it's unlimited, right? It's an ease, so with every type of hardship, there comes an ease that you can't even think of, that won't even occur to you. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats it. So the usra that came to the Prophet sallallahu it was a gift to him, alayhi uh, salatu was salam, was Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj, the night journey and ascension of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu And again, this was a gift given to him. Why was it given to him? لِنُورِيَهُ min ayatina, In order that we might show him some of our signs. لِعْلَمُ تَعْلِيلْ نُورِيَهُ There's a noon called Nunu Ta'zim. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks in the plural, the plural form. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uses the Nunu Ta'zim, the Jam'u Al-Maliki, uh, the royal plural, the object which is being addressed by the fi'l, by the verb, also has ta'zim and takrim. Linuria hu. Who is who? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In order for us to show him some of our signs. Tathbeetul qalb. To give him strength and certitude in his heart sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So the Isra is mentioned explicitly in the Quran. Subhan Aladi Asra bi Abdihi Laylan min al Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al Aqsa, Aladi Barak Nahawla, Linuriahu min Ayatina. 
إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Glory be to the one who carried his servant on a nocturnal journey, a journey by night, in one night, laylan, in one night, from the inviolable mosque, which is in Mecca, to the farthest mosque. And we'll talk about what is Masjid al-Aqsa. What is that? The farthest masjid, uh, which is in Jerusalem, uh, in order that we might show him some of our signs. So this is called Dalil Qat'i. This is a definitive proof of the Isra. A Muslim who denies the Isra is no longer a Muslim. He's entered into kufr because mentioned in the Quran. Dalil Qat'i, Qat'i to thubut Now bits and pieces of the Isra and Mi'raj are sprinkled across numerous ahadith. Many of the ahadith are actually uh, weak or have weakness in them. So it presents a challenge when trying to piece together uh, an authentic narrative and its chronology. The most authentic hadith in this regard is found in Bukhari, related by Anas ibn Malik and Malik ibn Sa'asa, and also in Sahih Muslim, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhum jami'an. So in one hadith in Bukhari, oh, first, linguistically, Isra is, like we said, a night journey. It's the mustar, a night journey, a journey that one goes at night. It's called Isra. The Mi'raj, this is Ismul Ala. This is actually a noun of instrument, right? So like Fataha to open, Miftah is the, the key, because the, the key is the instrument by which one opens. Or the Kawa, Kawa means to iron, the Mikwa is the iron, the actual instrument. So the Mi'raj is a noun of instrument. The ascension is called Uruj, the Uruj of the Prophet ﷺ. What is the Mi'raj? This is open to speculation. A staircase of gold, uh, a flying carpet, wallahu alam. Uh, but we believe in the ascension of the Prophet. ﷺ. Um, so, in, according to authentic hadith in Bukhari, where did this journey begin? According to Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, I was in Al Hatim uh, or Hijr Ismail when this journey began. Uh, in another hadith in Muslim, he says, Kuntu in al Bayt. I was next to the house, Baytullah in Mecca. So there's an important principle in usul. When you have two hadith that seem to contradict each other, you try to make them work together. This is called al-jama'ah, right? Harmonization of hadith. These are both strong hadith, sound hadith. We have to try to make them work together. And if you can't make them work, then you pick one. This is called tarjih. You pick a text based on preponderance of evidence. But you'll notice here there's no contradiction. Al-Hatim, which is Hijr Ismail, the semicircle, right, next to the Kaaba. This is actually part of the Kaaba, so you have to make tawaf around the Hatim. And it used to actually, so Kaaba used to be, actually be rectangular. It used to actually cover the top of this area as well, right? So that's Ind al Bayt, that's next to the house, that's at the house. There's no contradiction here. There are other hadith, uh, however, which state that the Prophet ﷺ was in the house of Umhani uh, that night. He was sleeping in the house of Umhani. Another hadith says, in the house of Abu Talib. Another hadith says, he was bain al-ithnayn. He was sleeping between two. How do we reconcile these hadith? Is it possible to harmonize them? Well, Umhani is the daughter of who? Anyone know? Who is the father of Umhani? Abu Talib. So it's the same house, right? And he was sleeping between two men, Ja'far and Hamza, right? which gives you an idea as to what was going on in Mecca at the time. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went to Ta'if, uh, Abu Lahab at the time was the chief of the Bani Hashim because Abu Talib had passed, and Abu Lahab did not offer any protection to his nephew ﷺ. So if the Prophet comes into Mecca, they can kill him on sight. So Mut'im ibn Adi, he protects the Prophet ﷺ, and Allah is his real protector, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now they're sleeping, men are, a group of men are sleeping in one house, to be safe. This is for uh, protective purposes, you can say. So the hadith of Umhani says, however, that Jibril alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet وسلم, through the roof, he opened the roof and plucked the Prophet out of the house of Umhani, if you will. Right? Why was that necessary? Because you can imagine a small room that's full of men sleeping on the ground. How are you going to get to the, the door? I mean, it's not a big issue. but. According to this hadith, he went through the roof, right? Uh, so how do we reconcile these sets of hadith with the previous hadith that say the Prophet ﷺ was in Al-Hatim? Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, a great hadith master, Al-Hafidh, he says 
that initially on that night, the Prophet ﷺ was in the house of Umhani, in the house of Abu Talib, also known as the house of Abu Talib. He was sleeping between Jafar and Hamza, and then Jibreel ﷺ pl plucked him out of that house and then took him to Al Hatim. This is how he reconciles all of these hadith, and this makes total sense, no problem whatsoever. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, at this point, Jibreel ﷺ, he has him lie down and he splits his chest open and he removes his heart and he washes his heart with zamzam. Another hadith says with iman. Again, there's no contradiction here. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions that it was a, a tost min dahab, a bowl or a tray made of gold that his heart was placed in. So according to our sharia, we can't use like utensils that are gold and silver, eat from a cereal bowl that's gold, you know, it's, it's not permissible. So the ulama struggle with this. Some of them say, well, this is very early, and you know, this is in the Meccan period, so these types of ahkam were not revealed yet. Another more interesting interpretation is that the bowl, this tust min dahab, it came from Jannah, right? So the fiqh of Jannah applies here. And in Jannah, no problem. La bas alayk. You can eat from utensils made of gold. No problem whatsoever. So this splitting of the chest had happened before. Some of the ulama say two times, some say three times, but this time the haddu shaitan does not remove this black clot. So how do we understand this haddu shaitan? This is very important because a lot of the orientalists and a lot of Christian apologists, they attack this. Haddu shaitan means the portion of shaitan. Now according to, this is a construct phrase. If you study Arabic, mudaf, mudaf, ilayhi, the construct noun, absolute noun. There's two ways to understand this according to the, the matan of the ajrumiyyah, which is a treatise of grammar in Arabic. You can either use the preposition min or lam. You can say haddun min shaitan or haddun lish shaitan. Right? Either a portion from the shaitan, which is rejected by the ulama, or a portion for the shaitan. So now the question is a portion of what? There's a portion of something for the shaitan in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. A portion of what? So the ulama give a beautiful answer here. They say a portion of mercy that he might have had for the shaitan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want him to have mercy for the shaitan. Because the Prophet ﷺ is mercy. His very essence is mercy. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses an ism here. We did not send you except as a mercy, and nakira, it's indefinite, meaning a mercy that is uncontained, unlimited, unfathomable. This is the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't use a fi'l. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا أَن تَرْحَمْ الْعَالَمِينَ or something like that. He says, you are mercy. Right? So this is how we understand. So this didn't happen this time. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says that a dabbah was brought to him, which is a beast some sort of animal. And he describes it, Dun al baghli wa fawqa al himar, abyad, according to the sound hadith. He says it was smaller than a mule, but larger than a donkey, and it was white. And this beast is called al buraq, which comes from probably from the root uh, of barq. And barq means lightning. Lightning. Right? There's an interesting verse in Matthew and in Luke. In the New Testament, Al Ahd al Jadid, Wallahu Alam. There's been tahrif, but there's difference of opinion whether uh, the ma'ana as tahrif or the actual text, and some say both. There's difference of opinion. Imam Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, there's difference of opinion. Nonetheless, it's interesting because Isa alayhi salam, according to Matthew and Luke, uh, and if they have something in common, that means that the source is called Q, which is very early. We don't want to get into a lot of academical jargon, but it's a very good source of the New Testament. Isa uh, is reported to have said that the apocalyptic son of man, he calls him the Bar Inash in Aramaic. He's always talking about someone to come after him called Bar Inash, the Bar Inash, the Bar Inash, right? Which means the son of man, the son of humanity. This person has universal appeal, a universal message. He's an alamiya, right? He's rahmatan lil alameen. He's a universal prophet. He says, this son of man, uh, he will come to the West like lightning. He will come as lightning. Right? In the, the Barak, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Barak takes its front hooves and places it on the horizon and then will leap and fold up the earth like that. This is how fast the Barak can travel. Some of the later um, Muslims said that the Barak had a, the head of a woman and the tail of a peacock and wings 
None of these things are authentic. The Burak is simply a white horse. If you looked at the Burak, you said this is a little small horse. Okay? Now, as the Prophet ﷺ is going north towards Jerusalem, uh, he's going very fast, obviously, but he actually can describe, he actually notices things as he's passing by. Because the Prophet ﷺ is not just looking with his eyes, he's looking with his heart, right? And the heart of the Prophet ﷺ is extremely vast. So he knows very, very particular details about things when he's flying overhead at very high speeds. So the heart is vast. This is why it says in the Shema'il al nabawiyyah of Imam Tirmidhi that you know, the Prophet ﷺ had many, many Sahaba, had thousands of Sahaba, right? And when he would sit in the majlis, he would remember, I haven't seen Fulan in a few days. Oh, how is he doing? How is Fulan doing? How is he doing? He'd remember who he hasn't seen in a matter of days, right? Because the heart of the Prophet ﷺ is extremely vast. So actually he sees Musa السلام, praying in, a red, in his grave, a red dune, as he describes it. So he goes to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Now, this is interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. So if you look at the Temple Mount, I don't know how many people are familiar with sort of the lay of the land of old, the old city of Jerusalem. But dominating the old city of Al-Quds, Jerusalem, is this huge raised platform. This flat, huge platform, right? 1,800 feet uh, in length and about 600 feet across. It has a surface area of about 30 football fields. A quarter of a million people can easily fit on the Temple Mount. There's two structures on the Temple Mount, okay? To the southern end, the southern end, you have this building that has a black dome. This is called Al-Aqsa Mosque, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Okay? If you go north into about the middle of the platform and a little bit west, you'll find another structure called Masjid Qubbatul Sahara, the Dome of the Rock. Okay? Neither of these two structures were there at the time of the Prophet Does so everyone understand why? Neither of these two structures were there at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Because these two structures were built by the Bani Umayyah about 70 years after Sayyidina Umar had conquered the city of Jerusalem. The patriarch actually gave him the keys of the city. So what's on the Temple Mount at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Masjid al-Aqsa, he's not talking about the current Masjid al-Aqsa that wasn't there on the southern end. In fact, the southern end of the Temple Mount was added by Herod in the first century. That wasn't even there uh, at the time of Sulaiman salam. And actually, at the time of the Prophet wasallam, the Byzantine Empire was in control of Jerusalem. And they wouldn't allow any building of any structures on the Temple Mount. In fact, part of the Temple Mount, they turned into a garbage dump. It was a garbage dump to insult the Jews. So when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, when he actually got to Jerusalem and he noticed this huge garbage dump on the Temple Mount, he ordered it completely cleared away. And the Jews at that time were not even allowed to go into the city of Jerusalem. Since 125 of the Common Era, when the Emperor Hadrian kicked them out of the city, it was illegal for Jews to enter the city of Jerusalem. So to Sayyidina Umar, he allowed them back into the city. Right? So, wallahu alam, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to al-Masjid al-Aqsa? I think uh, Shaykh um, uh, Martin Ling's Abu, Abu Bakr al-Siraj, I think he, he has a, a, the right idea. And uh, Yusuf Ali mentions the same thing. He says it was the site of the old temple. The site of the old temple. And the site of the old haykal, the haykal of Sulaiman alayhi salam. The site of that temple was more likely where Masjid Quba al sahra actually was. That's the most likely position, because that's right in the middle of the platform. And that's the right over the foundation stone that is revered by Jews and Christians. So this is probably where the Prophet ﷺ led the prayer. So when he dismounted the Buraq, he tied the Buraq, he prayed the Raka'atain, he said, I turned around and Jami'ul Anbiya was behind me. Whether this was a resurrected form, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected the Prophets, 125, 124,000, Wallahu very easily could fit on the Temple Mount, very easily could have fit. Or was it the arwah, the spirits of the Prophet? Wallahu alam. 
But the Prophet وسلم, probably led the prophets in prayer uh, at the current place where we call Masjid Qubbat al-Sakhra. Uh, and then he ascended from that, from that point. Wallahu alam. Now, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud mentions a hadith that the Prophet وسلم, he met Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa alayhi salam during the Mi'raj. We don't know the exact chronology of this event. Whether this happened on the Temple Mount after the prayer, before the prayer, maybe in the Samawad somehow. When did it happen? We don't know. All we know is he did have a conversation with Musa, Ibrahim, and, and Isa alayhi salam uh, during Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. And something they discussed was Asa'a, the hour and the day of judgment. Okay? So, in other hadith that supplement this hadith, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually describes the physical appearance of these three men. Right? He said, Musa alayhi salam looked like the men of Shanua. Who knows here how the men of Shanua looked like? He doesn't give any details, right? So the Sahaba knew what he was talking about. However, in other hadith, he does actually describe more in detail of the physical description of Musa alayhi salam. And he says that he was a taller man, he was slender, well built, and had darker skin and had curly hair. And then he describes Isa alayhi salam, that he was shorter on the shorter side, very fair skin and lank hair, like his hair was wet. Right? And he says about Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُ مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا صَحِبُكُمْ He says that the nearest in appearance I've ever seen to Ibrahim is Sahibukum, is your companion, meaning himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they talk about Asa'a and Musa alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam, they have nothing to offer in this regard. But Isa alayhi salam tells him some interesting information. Isa alayhi salam says, between now and the sa'a is my ruju'. Between now and the hour is my return. And the Prophet sallallahu is the eschatological prophet. He is the nabi fi akhir zaman. He's the first major sign of the sa'a. Ana wa sa'a kahatain. He said, me and the hour are like this. And he put up two of his blessed fingers sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Isa alayhi salam is saying, but before that happens, I'm going to return. And then, and the Christians believe in this as well. This is called the parousia, as mentioned in the New Testament. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates in the Quran, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ الْسَعَةِ And that he is a sign of the sa'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَيُكَلِّمُ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَهْدِي وَكَهْلًا وَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ He will speak to the people in childhood and as a mature adult. And Ibn Jawzi, he says, Kuhuliya kahlan, this stage of life begins at age 35. And Isa alayhi salam ascended, according to one opinion, 31, the dominant opinion, 33. So he hasn't spoken kahlan yet. So he's going to return and speak uh, as an old man, if you will, or a mature man. And then Isa alayhi salam, he tells him about the Dajjal. He says, I'm going to kill the Dajjal outside Baytul Maqdis. And the Prophet sallallahu actually gave information about the Dajjal that no other prophet gave to his ummah. Right? He said, I'm going to tell you something about the Dajjal that no other prophet told their ummah. He says, Innahu a'war, wa rabbakum laysa bi a'war. He is one-eyed, and your Lord is not one-eyed. And he says, written on his forehead is kafara. The letter is kafara. Right? So, Allahu alam, we don't want to get into politics. We don't want to get into the conspiracy stuff. But you know the one eye is the sign of the Novus Ordo Seclorum the new world order, the new secular world age that a lot of people around the world are trying to bring into existence. It is a chief symbol of the Freemasons. It's on the back of the dollar bill, the seal of the United States of America, right? That's the, the eye of the sun god Ray, right? Which represents the kind of Dajjalic system of a one world type of government. Wallahu alam, right? No more politics. But one more thing I'll mention. <laughs> There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Bayhaqi in Abu Dawood, in which he says, there will come a time when the Ummah will invite themselves to the killing of Muslims, like they're inviting to a banquet hall. Min qillatin nahnu yawma idhin, yawma idhin. Are we very small in number, Ya Rasulullah? Bal antum yawma idhin kathirun. No, you are many, but you're like the, the scum of the ocean. 
You're like scum. There's nothing to you. You don't have quality, just quantity, right? One of these organizations, you can do research on this, is called the Council on Foreign Relations. Just do research on it. Just file it in your head. The Council on Foreign Relations, whose initials are CFR. Kafara. Allahu alam. Anyway, and then the Prophet وسلم, he's told from Isa alayhi salam about Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, right? As they're talked about or translated in English. And he says that they're going to basically run amok on the earth and they're going to consume all of the earth's resources, right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Min kulli hadabin yansilun. They'll come down from every direction running amok. And Isa alayhi salam says, I'm going to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will die in their tracks. And then their stench is going to fill up the earth. And they'll make another dua and the rains will, will come and wash them away. These are some informations that are coming to the Prophet sallallahu from Isa alayhi salam on the night of Isra and Mi'raj. Um, at this point then, two vessels are presented to the Prophet sallallahu One has laban and one has khamar. One has milk and one has wine. And Jibir alayhi salam says, you must choose one and whichever you choose, it has implications for your ummah. So wine, or we start with milk. Milk is pure, it's nourishing, it's nutritious, it strengthens the frame, it's calcium. It strengthens your frame, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, milk is the only food that can be a food and a drink at the same time. Milk is a food and a drink at the same time. It's the only food like that, right? Uh, or khamar, which of course is old grape juice that has bacteria and smells like urine and intoxicates, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he chooses the milk and he says, you have been guided to the path primordial, the deen of the fitrah, right? Because this is the first thing that the child will drink from the mother, is the milk. So this is a deen that appeals to the fitrah of the human being. Whereas Christianity chose wine, right? During the Eucharist, this is one of the sacraments of the Christian religion, right? They chose wine, sanctified it. That's why the theology of Christians doesn't jive well with the fitrah. And I'm going to tell a story about my daughter. She's probably not going to like it. But when she was about seven years old, <laughs> uh, she was sitting at the dinner table. She was doing her Arabic homework, and I was flipping channels, which is a bad idea, right? So don't do that. When a child is doing homework, turn off the TV. Anyway, so I'm flipping channels, and this Christian preacher comes on. I like to listen to Christian preachers. They're very interesting people. They talk for three, four hours, and it's just hot air. You don't get a single point of what they're saying. Because it's all from the hawa, right? Hawa is like hot air, right? Wa ma anil hawa. The Prophet doesn't speak from hawa. He, give, he gives you gems. He gives you something to go off of, something to guide you. Anyway, so this Christian preacher is talking about God came to the world and God came down to the earth and so on and so forth. And my daughter's doing her homework and she stops and she looks at the TV and she says, God, earth, negative. <laughs> so this is her fitrah, yani. Seven years old. This just didn't make sense to the, the innocent child, right? Sometimes the intellect gets in the way, though. We'll talk more about that when we talk about mu'ajizat, inshallah. So anyway, he picks the milk. Now he begins an ascension, his uruj, into the samawat. And these samawat are not the jannat, right? These are not the paradises. These are samawat, okay? And he meets seven prophets in various samawat. And it's interesting, the ulama say something really interesting here. They say, if you look at the prophets that he met, there's actually some sort of foreshadowing or typology that's going to happen in the life of the Prophet So he meets Adam السلام, in the Sama'u dunya This is the first heaven, right? The first heaven is called as Sama'u dunya This is the perceptible universe. The perceptible universe. The universe that has stars and planets and galaxies. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَزَيَّنَّا أَسْسَمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِحَا We have decorated, we have beautified the first heaven with lamps or lights. What are these lamps or lights according to the Mufassirin? Nujum, these are stars. So all of these images we're getting back from the Hubble telescope and whatnot of galaxies thousands of light years away, whatever they're saying. This is just the Sama'u dunya This is the first heaven. Beyond that, there's six more. And beyond that, there's something else. 
So he meets Adam alayhi salam in the Sama'ud Dunya, and as we know, the ulama, they point something out here, really beautiful. They say, just as Adam alayhi salam was exiled from the garden, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam will also be exiled from Mecca. You see, there's a Muhammadan typology here, if I can use that word. A foreshadowing of something that's going to happen very shortly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. That's why these specific prophets, he doesn't meet Nuh, he doesn't meet uh, um, uh, Ya'qub, Ismail, he doesn't meet these prophets. Zakaria, he doesn't meet them. There's seven specific prophets. So in the second heaven, he meets Isa alayhi salam, Isa ibn Maryam, and Yahya ibn Zakaria. Right? So these are cousin prophets. Now what's the significance here is that both of these prophets were persecuted by their own people. One of them killed and one was attempted to be killed. Yahya alayhi salam was decapitated by a puppet king of Judea, a Roman puppet. Right? named Herod, Herod Antipas. So the story says in the New Testament that Herod, he, it was his birthday. It was his molid, right? So he had all these guests in his palace and he wanted his own niece to dance in front of all of the men. This is, this is called a dayuth. It's the worst type of man. The worst thing you can call an Arab is a dayuth. Someone who doesn't care about women, doesn't care who looks at his wife, doesn't care what his wife wears. Actually likes it. Yeah, look at my wife. Look what I have. It's called dayuth. So he says, dance, dance. Her name was uh, Salome, according to the New Testament. Wallahu alam. So then she says, I'll dance, but on one condition, you have to bring me the head of Yahya alayhi salam on a platter. So he says, fine. So she dances and they bring the head to her. Isa alayhi salam also was persecuted by Bani Israel. They're cousins, they're contemporaries with Yahya alayhi salam. But they did not kill Isa alayhi salam. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِيَ لَهُمْ In fact, we've mentioned this many, many times. The name of Isa alayhi salam in Aramaic is Yeshua. Yeshua is an ism maf'ul. It's a passive participle. The root is yasha, which means to save. What is the passive participle to save? Is the one saved. This is what his name means. The one who was saved. Right? Yeshua. So the U, if you study Hebrew, very similar to Arabic. Like in Arabic, we say maf'ul. They see the U in the middle? U'l. That means passive. The action was done to it. Yeshua, the one saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is literally what his name means. So then, we have the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 13 assassination attempts during his life by different people. In fact, uh, just before the Hijrah, the Quraysh had sort of an emergency Darul Nidwa, right? This was kind of a city council. And they said, oh, what are we going to do with him? And according to Sira literature, this strange black figure is wearing a black clothes. He came into the Darul Nidwa. They call him Sheikh Najdi. Sheikh Najdi. He comes in, he sits, and he listens for a little bit, listening to the deliberation. What are we going to do about the Prophet He says, what do you think we should do, Shaykh al Najdi? Right? Mada tara? What is your opinion? He says, Uqtuluhu, just kill him. He says, Oh. And Abu Jahal says, Great. And he takes credit for the idea. And the Shaykh al Najdi was the shaitan who had come into the majlis. So this is one of the first assassination attempts of the Prophet. Ibn Mas'ud actually says that part of the reason why he had passed uh, is because of the poison that he had ingested. Ibn Mas'ud mentions this that a Jewess from Bani Nadir gave him some poison many years earlier and he had ingested it. One of his companions actually died because of it. Uh, and, uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prolonged his life uh, as a mu'jiza because he had to finish his risala. But the ulama mentioned, Ibn Mas'ud mentions that he actually died a shaheed. He was given the honor of, of the of istishhad. Wallahu alam. In the third heaven, he meets Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam, what happened during his life is that he was persecuted by his brothers, right? Persecuted by his brothers, and then his brothers came to him begging, have mercy, have mercy, right? And he forgave them. So you have the Prophet وسلم, being chased out of Mecca, and he's attacked several times, and then he comes back into Mecca, Akhun Karim, Akhun Karim. You are a noble brother, you are a noble brother. And what does the Prophet ﷺ say to them? He quotes from Surah Yusuf. And he says, La alaykum al Exactly what Yusuf ﷺ had told his brothers. There is no blemish on you today. 
right? Another typology of the Prophet In the fourth heaven, he meets Idris alayhi salam, who's called Khanukh in Hebrew or Enoch. Idris, not much is said in the Quran about Idris alayhi salam, except what kurfil kitabi Idris, innahu kana siddiqan nabiyya wa rafa'annahu makanan aliyya. Relate or remember in the book the story of Idris. He was a, a siddiq, he was truthful and a prophet, and we raised him to a high place. And the fourth heaven is a very high place. Now, keep in mind, however, these seven heavens are not indicative of the maqam of the particular prophet. They're not commensurate with the maqam or daraja of the particular prophets that are found in them, because these are not jannat. In fact, all the prophets are in the seventh heaven. Because Isa alayhi salam is from ulul azmi min al rusul. He's one of the five most exalted prophets, but he's in the second heaven, whereas Idris is in the fourth heaven. By consensus, Isa alayhi salam's daraja or maqam, wallahu alam, is higher than Idris. So why are they found at these different levels? Wallahu alam. We have to do further research and see what the ulama say about it. Anyway, just as Idris was raised, وَرَفَعَنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّا وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have raised your dhikr to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We mentioned this many times in the past, that right now, somewhere in the world, somebody is shouting, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. On the earth, the dhikr is exalted. This is happening 24 7 around the clock, every single second of every single day until Yom Al Qiyamah, somebody is saying, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, loudly somewhere. And if you just forget about what's going on in the Sama'ud Dunya, what's going on in the Malakut, is ajib how the Prophet's name has been raised because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yusalli alayhi Allah prays upon or blesses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that's enough if Allah praises you nobody can debase you nobody can say anything to you even if the whole world was insulting you and wanting to kill you and denigrating you if Allah is pleased with you Allah is totally sufficient for you and then in the fifth heaven, he meets Harun alayhi salam. And the interesting thing about Harun alayhi salam is that initially he was hated by his people. And this is what's going on with the Prophet alayhi salam during this time. That's why he's sleeping with a group of men in a small room because he's afraid of people coming in and massacring them, right? His people hated him at this time. But then, because Harun alayhi salam, they came and said, fashion the golden calf. In the Torah, it actually says he acquiesced and said, fine, let's make a golden calf which is mustahil, impossible for a prophet to do that. A prophet cannot disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, it wasn't Harun alayhi salam. It was this man called As-Samiri who did that, right? So they got angry according to the Quranic narrative. They were very angry with Harun alayhi salam. They wanted to kill him. That's why Musa alayhi salam, when he descended Sinai, he came to Harun alayhi salam, he took him by the beard. And Musa alayhi salam had shidda, right? Very tough. One time he punched the angel of death, and <laughs> his eye fell out. You don't mess around with Musa alayhi salam. That's why the Prophet alayhi salam, he said, Sayyidina Umar is like Musa. Don't mess around with Umar. Right? So, anyway, he took Harun by his beard and he said, no, these people are going to kill me. I didn't do anything. Right? So on and so forth. So, the Prophet alayhi salam, was hated by his people. Why? Because he wouldn't fashion for them their golden calves, alat and al-uzza and manat. He wouldn't worship these gods. He was very uncompromising. When he finally took Mecca, they said, okay, one day of one hour, we'll, we'll worship Al-Uzza. No. Nope. One minute, one sec. No. Nope. One minute. No. Nope. Nothing. It's shirk. Of course not. Kufr. You can never be pleased with kufr. A prophet is never pleased with kufr. A mu'min is never pleased with kufr. Rida bil kufri, kufr. If you're pleased with kufr, this is kufr. Right? So the, the people of the Prophet, they hated him initially, and then they came to love the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi in the sixth heaven, he meets Musa alayhi salam, and there's a lot of similarities between Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And if you want to take a class with me on comparative religion, we'll study a prophecy. And Dr. Umar Farooq, he actually, may Allah preserve him, he says, he quoted Deuteronomy 18.18 18 and said, that's the verse, the definitive verse that establishes the responsibility of Ahl al-Kitab to believe in the Prophet sallallahu That Allah will raise a prophet like Moses from the Israelite brethren and God will speak to him words and this prophet will repeat those words. And this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you read the Quran, you'll quite often find a correspondence between the two prophets, Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We sent, for example, in Surah Muzammil, we sent a prophet 
unto, we sent unto you a prophet to be a witness just as we sent a prophet unto Fir'aun. Right? So Musa and the Prophet there's a correspondence there. Waraka bin Nawfal knew about this prophecy. He said, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ أَنَّمُوسُ الْأَكْبَرُ كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَى مُوسَى There has come unto you the great law just as it came to Musa So Musa he knows the type of difficulties that the Prophet is going through. In the seventh heaven, he meets Ibrahim And from Ibrahim of course, he inherits the rights of the Hajj. Now, in the seventh heaven, the Prophet he saw major ayat, major signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First, he saw the Baytul Ma'mur. The Baytul Ma'mur is the celestial Kaaba, the Kaaba of the heavens. Right? So directly above the earthly Kaaba in Mecca, in the seventh heaven, is the Baytul Ma'mur. Right? And the ulama say, if the Baytul Ma'mur fell to the earth, it would fall right on top of the earthly Kaaba. And the Prophet wasallam said, 70,000 angels enter the Baytul Ma'mur. Every day, 70,000 angels enter the Baytul Ma'mur and they don't leave. This happens every day, which gives you an idea how many malaika there are. There are way more malaika than there are jinn and ins and haywanat. Right? And Ibrahim السلام, according to one tradition, was leaning on the Baytul Ma'mur when the Prophet ﷺ saw him. And then he saw the Jannat, he saw the heavens, the, sorry, the, the, the gardens, he saw paradise, which were in the seventh heaven. And then he saw Jibreel السلام, in his true form. And this was the second time he had seen him in his true form. And we'll talk about the first time, inshallah ta'ala. And Jibreel السلام, had 600 wings, 600 wings. And then he saw something called as Sidratul Muntaha. As Sidratul Muntaha. This is the lot tree of the outermost region. The lot tree, it's a tree, Shajara, of the outermost region. This is the end of the seventh heaven. Imam Nawawi says the trunk of the lot tree begins in the sixth heaven and its leaves or branches extend into the seventh heaven. So this is a massive, huge, celestial tree that is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to Sahih Muslim in Bukhari, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Anas ibn Malik, the, the Prophet sallallahu said that the fruits of the Sidratul Muntaha are like the jars of the people of Hajar. The jars of the people of Hajar. Who knows how the jars of the people of Hajar look like? We don't know how they look like. But the Sahaba, they knew what he was talking about. And apparently some of the ulama say that they were huge storage jars, as tall as a man. These are the fruits, these look like the fruits of as sidratul muntaha. The Prophet ﷺ said the leaves of as sidra are like adhanul fi'ala, are like the ears of elephants. Now, there's no indication that the Prophet ﷺ actually saw an elephant during his life. But this is how he describes it. The first elephants, actually, actually a funny story, the first elephants actually came into uh, Medina during the time of Imam Malik. Right? He was teaching the Muwatta and he had a group of students that were in front of him and a caller called out, there's elephants outside. <laughs> so all of his students left except Yahya ibn Yahya. One man sat in the front row. And Imam Malik, he stopped, you know, take a break. He said, aren't you gonna go out and see the elephants? And he said, ma jitu li ajli fi. I didn't come for the sake of elephants, right? So this has become like an idiom in Arabic, right? That if you go somewhere for an important purpose and someone's talking about God knows whatever, you say, come on, I didn't come for elephants. Let's get to the point. Let's study the hadith. Do you see the idiom? <laughs> anyway. And then the Prophet Wasallam, he sees alwan, these colors. These colors are enshrouding and enveloping the leaves of the Sidratul Muntaha, different colors, like waves, flowing over, changing the tree. The tree is dynamic, it's changing colors. And these are colors that are outside of the spectrum. The Prophet ﷺ said, La adri mahiya. I can't even describe to you what these colors are. I've never seen these colors that are going through the leaves and the trunk of a Sidratul Muntaha. This is truly an unbelievable spectacle. And then he said, there's firash min dhahab. There's butterflies of gold that are flying around a sidratul muntaha. And there are malaika flying around a sidratul muntaha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
He says in the Quran that was recited by Qari Umar, may Allah preserve him, إِذْ يَخْشَ السِّدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَى When the Sidra was enveloped or enshrouded with whatever it was enshrouded, ma. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he leaves it ambiguous. Right? Ma yaksha, whatever it was. It doesn't go into details. But the commentators say, these alwan, these dynamic colors outside of the spectrum, flowing in and out, passing over the sidra like waves, butterflies of gold flying around, malaika, these huge uh, um, uh, uh, fruits that are as big as jars, as big as a man, enshrouding and enveloping as sidratul muntaha. Wallahu alam. Wallahu alam. And then the Prophet وسلم, he said, I saw four rivers at the base of a Sidratul Muntaha. Nahrani, Batinani. Two rivers that are hidden, and these are Al Kawthar and As Sal Sabil. And then Nahrani, Zahirani. Two rivers that are apparent, and these are the Nil and the Furat. The Nil is in Egypt and Misr, and the Furat is in Iraq. So these are earthly rivers. How, how is their origin? At the base of a Sidrat al Muntaha? Wallahu alam. We don't know. Allahu alam. In fact, Genesis chapter 2 in the Torah, just an FYI, Genesis chapter 2 also mentions that there's a river that's flowing out of Eden, Gan Eden, as it's called in Hebrew. Gan Eden is Jannah to Adnin, the Garden of Eden. Or Jannah to Adnin is translated the Garden of Eternity. This river becomes Arva'a Roshim in Hebrew. Arva'a Roshim, or Arba'atu Ru'us. Becomes four heads, right? So there's something confirmed in the, in the Torah. We don't need the Torah. The Quran is sufficient. That's just an FYI for you. <laughs> and then at this point, Jibreel alayhi salam, he says, Ya Muhammad taqaddam. Oh Muhammad, you go forward now. Okay? So Jibreel alayhi salam cannot go beyond as Sidratul Muntaha. And the Prophet وسلم, he goes beyond as Sidratul Muntaha. And according to some traditions, Jibreel alayhi salam says, if I go further, I would combust into flames. Right? Because even though Jibreel alayhi salam is the teacher of the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, has the highest station, khayr al-khalqillah. Right? So some of the ulama say, obviously the Prophet وسلم, when he went beyond the Sidrat al-Muntaha, he was wearing clothes, he had sandals. Why didn't his clothes and sandals burst into flames? And the ulama say, because there's ittisal with the that of the Prophet. There's a connection to the Prophet. His sandal is connected to his foot. And they say it's a great lesson here. If you have strong ittisal, a strong connection with the Prophet وسلم, then the fire won't, you won't burst into flames. You won't be put into flames. You won't be put into flames. Have a strong connection to the Prophet According to Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet وسلم, when he went, went beyond the Sutra al Muntaha, he heard some scratching, scratching. So according to a sound hadith, the first, thing, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was al-qalam. And he told the qalam, uktub, write. And the qalam wrote all of history, meta-history, everything. It was writing, right? So the ulama say here that he heard the qalam writing. And there's no scribe, the pen is writing. Because no living creature is beyond this point, as sidratul muntaha. Only the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Kitabun indahu fawqa arshihi. There's a book with him above the arsh. So he comes into the presence of al-qalam and al-arsh. He's at the base of the arsh. And at this point, or at this maqam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks to his habib directly. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to a strong opinion, he uh, experiences the ru'ya, the beatific vision, in which he sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, how did he see him? Bila kayfiyya. It's amodal. It's impossible to describe. With his eyes, with his heart, with his ruh, with his es, how did he see him? Allahu alam. But this is a reality for the people of paradise. Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi says, Al-ru'yatu haqqun li ahli jannah. The ru'ya is a reality for the denizens of paradise. The people in jannah will see Allah. So why can't the Prophet ﷺ see him conceivably? Because the Prophet is what? He's better than the people of paradise. The Prophet is better than paradise. He's better than paradise. So certainly this is conceivable for the Prophet ﷺ to have seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How did he see him? Allahu alam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
وَجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ نَاظِرًا إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا That you love the ajila, the fleeting gratification, the quick gratification, and you put off the afterlife. On that day, faces will be beaming, glowing, gazing at their Lord. Gazing at their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another surah, I think in surah Yunus, if I'm not mistaken, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا husna. If I'm not mistaken in reciting the ayah, for those people of Ihsan, there's a good thing. Waziyada. And something, something extra. A little extra. And Imam Ghazali says this ziyada is not something a little extra. This is it. This is the ru'ya. This is the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the greatest felicity in imaginable for a human being. The greatest joy imaginable is gazing upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bila kayfiya. There's no modality. We don't know how. Anyway. So make it clear, notice I mentioned in this maqam, he experiences the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We didn't say makan, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends makan. Makan means place. Laysa kamithlihi shay'un. Right? You are sitting in a place. Are you not? We're sitting in a makan. That, that means that Allah cannot reside in a makan. Because laysa kamithlihi shay'un. There's nothing like the likes of God. Allah who can. Qabla al-makan. Wa huwa al-an. Ala ma alayhi can. Qala ali karamallahu wajha. Allah was without, before any type of place. And he is now exactly as he was. Allahu mawjudun bila makan. Allah exists without place. No space, time, direction, materiality. Allah transcends all of these because these things are found in creation and laysa kamithlihi shay'un. Allahu mawjudun qabla al arsh. Allahu mawjudun qabla al kursi. Qabla al khalq. Allah is. Right? He has wujud. Period. Allah is being. Allah's, be, uh, Allah's existence is completely non-contingent. Our existence is contingent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, we don't have to exist. If you didn't exist, the world would get along just fine. And people think when they die, that's the end of the world. When I die, oh, there's going to be so much turmoil. When you die, your next door neighbor is going to wake up and have his bowl of Cheerios and read his newspaper and you're dead. And you're thinking, why isn't he caring about me? Life goes on. You are not, you're a, you a contingent being. You don't have to exist. Right? So people ask, well, where is God? You know, people get into these, these fitna. So, where, where is God? The question, where is God, is incorrect. The question is incorrect. You cannot answer an incorrect question. Right? Can you answer an incorrect question? What if I say, where do the whales fly? The whales. The humpback whale, where does it fly? Can you answer the question? Wallillahi so, al ala And with Allah is the greatest similitude. This is an example for you. That it's against the, it's against the nature of God to reside in a place. Just like it's the, against the nature of a whale to fly through the air. Where does the eagle swim? Right? So people say, where is God? Where aina? Aina Allah. Aina is darfu makan. There's no makan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no physical body sitting on this throne here. When the Prophet ﷺ goes to the base of the arsh, there's nothing made of germ, of matter. It doesn't have a space, time, directions. It's facing a certain way. No, 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 no. None of these types of things. That's why many of the Jewish theologians in the Middle Ages, the most celebrated theologians, like Joseph Albo, Maimonides, and Bahya, they all wrote in Arabic because they took from Muslim theologians. In Al Andalusia, via negativa, the, the way of negation. What does that mean? That means we can say more about Allah, about what Allah is not, than what Allah is. When we talk about the essence of Allah, when we talk about the essence of Allah, we can only say what it is not, not what it is. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses negative statements in the Quran. Laysa kemithlihi shay'un. There is not anything that resembles him remotely. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is nothing that resembles him. 
and walam yakun lahu kufwan ahad and there is nothing whatsoever comparable unto him right now in the mustadrak of al hakim quoted by imam suyuti in the jalalain and ibn abbas radiyallahu anhuma qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam ra'aytu rabbi azza wa jal aw kama qala i saw my lord the exalted and transcendent this is a hadith <coughs> How did it happen? Allahu alam. Fa'uha ila abdihi ma awha. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He inspired His servant with whatever He inspired him with. Again, ma awha. This is ambiguous. Allah doesn't go into details. Right? We'll never know exactly the extent of this ma, whatever He inspired him with. We don't know. Ibn Mas, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, in a hadith, of Sahih Muslim, he mentions three things that were given to the Prophet ﷺ during this time. Only three things that we know of. But what is the reality? Allahu Alam. He says the prayer was given to the Prophet ﷺ. It was made fard. The khawatim of Al-Baqarah, the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, were given directly into the heart of the Prophet ﷺ without Jibreel ﷺ, because Jibreel ﷺ is not in this place at the base of the arsh in this maqam at this station right it's only the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the end of surah baqarah which actually contains our essential creed the prophet sallallahu wasallam said about these ayatain that these are from the treasures from underneath the throne of god right amana rasulu bima unzilahi min rabbihi wal mu'minun and to the end of the surah this contains our essential creed that was given directly to the Prophet وسلم, into his heart by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any type of intermediation from Jibreel alayhi salam. And then a wa'ad for the mu'mineen of Jannah, a promise to the believers of paradise. Three things were given to the Prophet وسلم, during this time. The prayer, the salawat was made fard, the khawatim of al-Baqarah which, which attains our essential creed. One of my teachers said he went to some Islamic center and they said, brother, what's your aqidah? And he said, khawatim al-baqarah. And he said, that's not good enough. So that was good enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> he said, no, you need to tell us more. And he said, uh, hadith Jibreel, not good enough. Give us something more. He said, surah al-ikhlas, not good enough. Hey, ikhlas is a third of the Quran, right? Hadith Jibreel is yani, an exalted hadith. What, what do you want me to say? No, tell us, you know what we mean. What's your aqidah, brother? Right? <laughs> anyway. So then, the Prophet wasallam he begins a descent, and he goes by the seventh heaven, and he goes to the sixth heaven, and he sees Musa a.s. And Musa a.s. says, Bima umirt. What were you ordered? Why does Musa a.s. say this and not Ibrahim a.s.? The ulama say that's because Musa a.s. experienced something like this, but on a smaller scale, right? Musa a.s. was called up to Tur Sina, Mount Sinai, and he was there for 40 layla, 40 days. Musa a.s. knew when he went to the mountain, something would be given to him. The mitzvot, the commandments of God, the Torah was revealed to him. So Musa a.s. knows when a prophet is ascending like this, something is going to be given to him, right? So they said, what were you ordered? And this really shows the tafdeel of the Prophet ﷺ. That Musa ﷺ climbed a mountain called Sinai on earth. The Prophet ﷺ, he was on the Sinai on high, if you will. Sorry, I have bad jokes. 40 days, 40 nights for Musa ﷺ. One night. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi laylan. One night. All of this happened. Not 40. Musa alayhi salam, he spoke directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Through the shajra, the burning bush, as it's called. The bush in the sacred valley of Tuwa, and he had to remove his sandals, right? Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam beyond a big, a bigger shajra, right? As sidratul muntaha, and he kept his sandals on. These are some of the things that the, the uh, ulama mentioned. So Musa alayhi salam, he knew. So he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam says, uh, I was ordered, I was ordered 50 prayers. 
is irji'i la rabbik wa salhu takhfif. Go back to your Lord and ask for a reduction. He said, why? Because I dealt with some people. <laughs> I've dealt with some people. And they're never going to do, not even close. So the Prophet wasallam, according to, there's a hadith in Imam uh, Ahmad, that uh, the Prophet wasallam, when he heard that from Musa, he looked at Jibreel for permission. Ka'annahu yastashiruhu. Like he was... At, like he was wanting some ishara from Egypt, Jibreel alayhi salam. Is that okay to do, right? And there's a great lesson here, that if someone gives you advice, even if it's a doctor, and it's a little troubling, you should always get a second opinion, right? So the Prophet sallallahu he looks at Jibreel alayhi salam, and I don't know, Jibreel nodded or did something, gave him the thumbs up, Allah will give okay sign, you know? So the Prophet sallallahu he goes back up, and whether he went up in person or he made dua, Allahu alam, and then this was cut to 40. We know the story of 30, 20, 10, 5. Right? So he goes back to Musa alayhi salam. He says, what is it now? He said, 5. Go back to your Lord, because I've dealt with some people. And they are not going to do that. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he says, Sa'altu rabbi hatta istahyayt. I asked my Lord until I was a little embarrassed. That's enough. Five, right? And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that it was going to be five. And then a voice was heard according to the sound hadith. Nada munadin. A voice was heard. This is the voice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amdaytu faridati wa khaffaftu an ibadi. My order has been established. I have reduced the burden of my servants. It is five, but the reward is fifty. It is five, but the reward is fifty. And this really shows the importance of the Salat, that it was given to the Prophet Sallallahu as fard beyond as Sidratul Muntaha. And there are Muslims who don't even pray. If you're not praying five times a day, we have serious issues. If we're not doing the, the Salawat, we're not doing them on time, Fajr, Dhuhr, it's 17 rak'at. Some people say, oh no, you have to do the Sunnah, then you have to do some Nafila, then I have to do Tahajjud. Start with Wudu and do 17 rak'at. And then add the two before Fajr. And then give yourself, be patient with yourself, but not too patient. You've got to push yourself a little bit. If we're not doing the five daily prayers, there's something wrong with us. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, the difference between a kafir and a Muslim is a salah. Now, most of the muhaddithin say, this is a qualitative difference, not an essential difference. Meaning that a Muslim who isn't praying has the qualities of a kafir, but he can still be a Muslim. But Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he said, no, it's an essential difference that if a Muslim isn't praying, he's a kafir. So we have to be very careful about this. This is a big opinion, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. This is his opinion, that we miss prayers, we're entered in the state of kufr. That's why he said that, you know, if a Muslim wasn't praying until he was 19, 20 years old, he doesn't have to make up those prayers. Do you know why? Because he was a kafir. He doesn't have to make up those prayers, right? So we have to be very, very careful. This is a, this is a, a gift that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Gave him the Salah. During this time, beyond the Siddiratul Muntaha. What time do I have to, to stop? Huh? Ten of? It's already passed up. Ten after? Ten o'clock. Okay. I'll try to get through what I want to say here, inshallah. Maybe we'll go a few minutes over if that's okay with people. If not, be gentle with me. <laughs> so the Prophet وسلم, at this point, he goes to Umhani and he tells her what happened. He says, I'm going to go tell the Quraysh who are sitting in the Hijr. She says, no, don't go. They're going to make fun of you. He says, no, wallahi, I'm going to tell them now. He goes to the Hijr Ismail. He tells them what had happened. And they're literally falling over each other laughing at him. You know how you laugh so hard you can't even stand? Right? And you start making noises like a donkey. <laughs> this is what they were doing. This is how hilarious it was to them. Many Muslims actually apostated. Muslims in Mecca. There's no munafiqeen in Mecca. Munafiqeen are in Medina. Why? There's no hypocrites in Mecca. Why? Because in Mecca, it doesn't pay to be Muslim. In Medina, it might pay. There's ghanima coming into the city. You still have to make ghazwa and things like that. You make excuses. And, oh, I can't go. I have a sick mother and blah, 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 blah. And give me some of that ghanima and war booty. And there's munafiqeen in Medina, but not in Mecca. Not easy to be Muslim in Mecca. 
Many of these people left. And this is interesting. What did they do? They judged Allah's power against their own intellects, which is obviously erroneous because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power ala kulli shay, has power over all things. He has qudra mutlaq. He has uh, absolute and qualitatively infinite power. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can certainly do things that you cannot conceive of. Ibn Qayyim said, one of the roots of all fitna is when we subjugate our revelation to our intellect. We subjugate the revelation to our intellect. Aql intellect is extremely important, no doubt about it. We need to make sense of the world to establish justice on earth. We need the aql. No, there's no difference of opinion about that. Aql is very important. But there are certain things that we believe in as Muslims that are called sam'iyat, mughayyibat. These are supra-rational events that are given to us in scripture, that are binding upon us, part of our aqidah, to believe in them. So if you say, I don't believe in the Isra because it doesn't make sense to my mind, are you saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't do that? He can't take a man from Mecca and put him in Medina in one night? Allah can't do that just because you can't think of, Allah, you can't think of how that can happen? That means Allah can't do it? No, Allah can do it. Well, kullu amrin alayhi yaseer. Everything to him is very, very easy. The aql has a jurisdiction. It has a limit. If I think as hard as I can, I cannot think about, I cannot remember what I had for lunch two years ago from this night. What did I have for lunch? If I thought about it for two years, it'll never come to me. That means my aql is extremely limited. There is something there, no doubt about it. Right? Obviously there's something there. I passed business calculus. I got a B minus though. But there's something there. It's not, there's not a lot there for me, but there's something there, right? But we never subjugate the revelation under the aql. This is a mu'tazilai type of thing, a rationalist belief. It doesn't make sense to me, it's impossible, it doesn't happen. So you know people in this postmodern, we live in this deconstructionist mentality, there are no miracles, there's no normative Islam, there's no objective morality, truth is all relative, you know, I'm a progressive Muslim, I'm progressive. All the religions are equal and the same. There's no miracles. There's no moral objectivity. I'm progressive. Well, if you think progressive is placating human beings and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not progressive. That's very stupid. It's very ignorant. So I hear Muslims, I hear Muslims all the time. Quoted a hadith one time. This Muslim came up to me and said, you this hadith you quoted, a lizard speaking? Come on, brother. This is ridiculous. This is what he said to me. How can a lizard speak? Right? A tree trunk, the lizard speaking, is, there's weakness in that hadith. But the tree trunk crying, this is tawatur. This is multiply attested hadith. Right? The tree trunk was crying when the Prophet ﷺ had left it and was giving khutbah inside the masjid. Tawatur, mutawatur, multiply attested. You have to believe in it. Say, so how can you believe in these things? This is ridiculous. Allah can't make a, a tree cry. Allah created a universe out of nothing. Allah created a universe out of nothing. He can't make a lizard speak. It's very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that. So I told his brother, I said, you know, in qalahu faqad sadaq. You know, if the Prophet mentioned something, then it's true. And who said this? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Because this is exactly what some of the mushrikeen were saying to him. Do you know what he's saying now? So what are they saying? He went to Jerusalem last night. Initially, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him about the Mi'raj, the, the Uruj. He said, I went to, initially it was just the Isra. So he's saying that, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, in qalahu faqad sadaq. If he said it, it's true. You know what else I believe that's bigger than that? That an angel comes to him with words from the Lord of the seven heavens. Isn't that bigger than making a night journey to some city a few thousand miles, a hundred miles away? What's greater? Right? So, in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah, he says, لَمَّا كَذَّبَنِي قُرَيْشٌ قُمْتُ فِي الْحِجْرِ فَجَالَ اللَّهُ لِي بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ He says, when the Quraysh belied me, I stood in the Hijr, and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala manifested Jerusalem before my eyes, or the Baytul Maqdis, the Temple Mount, the, the old city, the surrounding areas. It manifested before me. And he said, I began to describe it while I was looking at it, I'm describing windows and doors and pillars and, and some of the men that were there had been to Jerusalem. So they confirmed the story, confirmed the description. 
and they knew the Prophet ﷺ had never been to Jerusalem when he was younger. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, you know, in a few days, there's going to be a caravan coming into Mecca. So, so a caravan always comes into Mecca. He said, yeah, but this one's missing a camel. This caravan is missing a camel. One of the camels bolted. Because when I was flying overhead, I noticed this. Camel bolted away. He said, ha, 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 ridiculous. So a few days later, lo and behold, here comes a camel. Here comes a caravan missing a camel. So I'll end with this, inshallah. These are the verses that our teacher, Qari Umar, may Allah preserve him, recited in Salat al-Isha, in the first raka'ah. So this, these verses are about the mi'raj of the Prophet Surah Al-Najm, ayah number one. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Najmi idha hawa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he's taking an oath. This is called an oath formula, a qasam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a qasam, an oath by something, that thing is extremely important. So you have to listen. One najmi. So najm here in majrur, there's a kasra, because this wow is called wow al qasam. By the star. Ida hawa, when it comes down. Imam Sayyuti said, this star is uh, Thurayya. This is the star constellation Pleiades. Because this is a great ayah in ayatillah, right? Respected by the pre Islamic Arabs and something great, according to the Muslims, a great sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Imam At Tustari says something interesting here. He says, the Najm here is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By the star when it comes down, meaning when this star, when this Najm, when this celebrity, because you know, even today we call our celebrities stars, he's a movie star, he's a Football star, whatever you want to say. But the star, an najm is the Prophet ﷺ. By the star when it comes down, by this great illuminating light when he came down from the heavens. Allah is taking an oath by the Prophet ﷺ and coming down from the heavens. The nuzul of the Prophet ﷺ. Maddalla sahibukum wa ma ghawa. Your companion is neither astray nor being misled. This is called the jawabul qasam, right? So you have the qasam and the jawab. You have the oath and then the answer. If I say, for example, I swear to God, you'll say, what? Why do you swear to God? I have to give a jawab. I swear to God that I prayed Fajr on time, for example. <laughs> right? That's the jawab al qasam. So he's saying, your companion, your sahib, the Prophet ﷺ, is neither astray nor being misled. He does not speak from hawa. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا This is a fi'l mudari'. Yantiqu is a present tense verb, in perfect tense. In perfect tense in Arabic is usually negated with la. La yaf'al, for example. La ashrabu qahwatan. But if you say ma, this means never. Never. Ma yantiqu. Never does he speak from his hawa. Not just when he's reciting Quran or on occasion. Never. لا يخرج منه إلا الحق. I swear by the one who holds my soul in his hand, the Prophet ﷺ said, nothing comes out of this except the truth. Nothing. He doesn't speak from his hawa. And notice, hawa in the first verse is a, is a verb. Right? This is now a noun. What does hawa mean? Hawa is like, you know, his caprice, his desire. Hawa, you go to a place, there's a, there's a, there's a state called hawa'i. Right? People go there for vacation. Do you want to go to uh, Umrah? No, let's go to Hawaii. The land of desire and air. And let's go over there and, and live out our Hawa. Right? The land of Hawaii. Right? The, the, the place of caprice and desire. There was an Arab Muslim walking in Hawaii. He said, Huna Lu'lu. Huna Lu'lu. Pearl Harbor. Huna Lu'lu. I'm serious. In huwa illa wahyu yuha. This is a negation, right? This is called ithbat ba'da nafi. Strong negation, a strong tawkid, a strong emphasis. Like you say, la ilaha illallah. Strong emphasis. It is nothing except wahi that comes to him. It is not except wahi that comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allamahu shadeed al quwa. He is taught by one mighty in power. Udhu mirratin fastawa the possessor of strength, for he appeared in stately form. This is Jibreel He appeared in stately form. 
This is a jumlatul haliya, wallahu alam, a circumstantial sentence. While he was in the highest horizons. This is the first appearance of Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu after the Laylatul Qadr, when he appeared in the way that in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him with 600 wings. When the Prophet exited the cave, he looked up on the horizon, filling the horizon, Jibreel alayhi salam. And here, the, the ulama say, some of them say, this is a reference to beyond the Siddilatul Muntaha. Then he approached and came closer. And he was within two bow lengths, a bow, two of these, 12 feet from his Lord. This is majaz. This is not literal. This is figurative, right? This is a figure of speech in Arabic. That means you're really, really close to something. Really, really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in no anthropomorphic way. And then he conveyed the inspiration to his servant, whatever he conveyed. The only three things we know about are the salah, the khawatim of Baqarah, and the wa'ad, and the promise given to the mu'mineen of Jannah. The Prophet's heart and mind did not falsify what he saw. Fu'ad is heart and mind. The Prophet's heart and mind, how do you see with your heart? His heart, ra'a, saw. His mind, ra'a. It did not falsify it. Will you dispute with him concerning what he sees? Notice here the fi'l mudari is iltifat. It went from ra'a to yara. Meaning that, what is fi'l mudari? Nihayatuhu la tu'lam. Imperfect tense. Meaning the action has not been completed. He's seeing. It's a perfect tense. Wallahu alam. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى Indeed, he saw him a second time. عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى Near the lot tree of the outermost region. The سِدْرَةُ الْمُنْتَهَى Right? The end of the seventh heaven. عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى Near it is the garden of abode. The garden, the jannat, begin in the seventh heaven, according to many of the ulama. إِذْ يَغْشَ السِدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَى when the sidra was enveloped by whatever it was enveloped, right? We talked about the alwan, the colors rolling over the sidra, the firash, the malaika, the tuyur, the birds as well, the butterflies, the angels, right? When that happened, ma al basaru wa ma taga. The Prophet's sight never swerved, nor did it transgress. Laqad ra'a min ayati rabbihi al kubara. Verily, he saw of the signs of his Lord, the greatest, the greatest ayat. He saw Al-Anbiya, Jibril alayhi salam, Baytul Ma'mur, As-Sidratul Muntaha. He saw Jannah and Nar. There's many, many other things that he saw, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we have to stop. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us the true significance of these events and give us the ability to implement, implement the fard salawat in our lives every day and give us a tawfiq to be uh, strict about our prayer times and give us a tawfiq, uh, the providence to teach our children to pray on time five times a day inshallah ta'ala. May Allah bless all of you.